Hello again, gang. In this talk, I'd like to go over a method for solving unconstrained minimization problems called steepest descent. You can use it for unconstrained problems, and if you apply the exterior penalty function, you can also transform constrained problems into an equivalent unconstrained problem. You can also solve using steepest descent. Now, steepest descent is not the most efficient multivariable minimization method out there, but it's very robust. It always finds the answer. Okay? So the nice part about it is that as we're using it in either uh, pre-program, you know, canned code, or we're using it in, with uh, code we've written, it acts you know, to the user. The user interface looks about like any other. So if you learn to use steepest descent and you learn how it behaves, you'll have insight into how more sophisticated methods behave. Okay? So, first thing we got to do is we got to get the mathematical background. Steepest descent works according to something called the gradient. I think I did another video elsewhere explaining what the gradient is, but just to keep this kind of compact and self-contained, let's go over that again real quick. Let's imagine design space with variables x and y. So we've got, in this case, we've got two design variables. So design space is 3D. We've got one direction, one dimension for each of the design variables, and the third dimension coming out of the board is the objective function. Well, the way we do that on my two-dimensional board or your two-dimensional screen is we'll draw a contour plot. And I'm just going to make up a shape here. It doesn't matter really what the shape is for this conversation, although it'll matter a lot later. Um, there's the minimum. Okay, and we're going to start somewhere out here in design space and we're going to look for that minimum. Okay, that's the big idea. Find that from somewhere else and do it in the lowest possible number of calculations. We're interested in efficiency here because even though our simple examples would be easy to calculate in practical problems, uh, oftentimes calculating the objective function even once is expensive. So we're trying to make our uh, algorithms, our solution methods, both, ro both robust, that means they always work, and efficient, which means they don't require much calculation. Typically those are trade-offs. There's, there's few free things in this world. Robust and efficient are often opposed to one another. So let's say we start out here. That's our starting point. It's our initial guess. And it may not be very good. If we knew how to make the initial guess really good, we might not have a problem to solve. So it'll go here. There's x. Uh, I'll call that x1. I'm going to put that in the, in, well, actually, I'll put a denominator here. Um, if you haven't noticed already, bookkeeping is kind of a, actually, it'll be zero. Bookkeeping is uh, always a problem when you're doing multivariable problems. It's uh, when you have lots of design variables and constraints and everything else, just keeping track of everything is sometimes one of the harder parts of the problem. So there's our starting point, x0 and y0. What steepest descent does is it slides downhill in the direction that gives you the highest slope. Okay, So in the way this works, highest slope slope is perpendicular to uh, contour lines. And I'll get out of your way here in a second so you can see this. So the highest slope is perpendicular to the contour lines. These things are here, right here are contour lines. So the highest slope is going to be pretty much that direction. Okay, That's highest downhill slope. Highest uphill slope is that way. Let me get rid of this right here. So that's the highest possible slope. And that's the lowest possible slope and going in the opposite direction. Now, what do you mean highest and lowest slope? Isn't when, you, when you're looking at a curve, you find a point and there's only one slope? Yes, but only when you're looking at a curve. When you're looking at a surface, to find the slope, you need not only a location, you need a direction. There's two things you've got to have. Now, let, I'm going to do this in kind of a thought experiment, and I'm going to grab the kind of cheesy prop I came up with here. Imagine you're on the side of a hill, okay, you're going mountain climbing or something, and you stop. And you go, okay, 
what's uh, what what's the steepest slope uphill? And you turn and turn and turn until you find a okay, That's the steepest slope uphill. Turn 90 degrees. What's the slope in that direction? It's zero. If you walk that direction, you're not going uphill or downhill. You're you're moving, but your altitude's not changing. That means. At, at some point where you're standing on the hillside, slope changes depending on which direction you're pointed. Okay, So just knowing where you are on the surface is not enough. You also need to know a direction. So I'm looking around my office trying to find something with enough of a curve I can use to illustrate a slope. So here's my skateboard helmet. Okay, I'm, I'm past the point where I will skateboard without a helmet. Um, and there, here's mine. It's got the little, I don't know what that is on it, triple eight. Yeah, whatever that is. Um, I'm probably marginally less cool with this thing on, but what do I care? Um, so let's find a point on this helmet, maybe right there. Okay, this thing is a curve. It's a you know it's, it's three dimensional. If I know where I am in, in in x and y, I can figure out a z. If I knew the equation that described the shape of this helmet, so this this is you can consider this a surface in 3D just like that. In fact, if I if I did enough measurements, I could make a contour plot of this, and it would look kind of like that. Um, if I say I'm right there, okay, right there on this helmet, what's the slope? Well, it depends on which way I'm looking. If I look that way, I'm going downhill. If I look that way, I'm going uphill. If I look that way, the slope is zero. Okay, so the big idea here is that slope on a surface depends not only on where you are, but what direction you're looking. Well, we're trying to find the lowest possible point on a surface it makes sense that we should move in the direction of maximum decrease okay, of the function, which means the lowest possible slope. So how do we describe that mathematically? Right there, if, the, if we call this function f of x, y, the direction of the slope, and we'll call that s as our search direction, is gradient of f. Okay? That's, that's the highest possible slope right there. I don't want the highest possible slope. I want the lowest possible slope. Okay, that's this right here. So the search direction we'll actually use, S1, is negative. Right? It's the negative of delta or gradient of f. Del or yeah, gradient of f. Now, in case you don't remember, gradient is a vector. Okay, and it consists of two elements in this case: partial f, partial x, and partial f, partial y. That sounds pretty abstract. It's really not. That backward six looking thing, which is called a partial derivative, means almost the same thing as the d you see in regular derivatives. This partial means that there are two uh, independent variables instead of one. So part, that, that backward six, when I say partial, that's a very compact, very precise, very clean way that mathematicians use to explain that that function f is a function of more than one variable. This is a partial derivative. It is the derivative of x with respect to, of f with respect to x. So it means you take the derivative of f with respect to x and you assume y as a constant. You treat it as a constant as if it were a number. Down here you do the opposite. Take the derivative of f with respect to y, so you assume x is a constant. Treat it like a number. Okay, so those are called partial derivatives, but it's just a, another way of, of, of writing a derivative, but it communicates one extra bit of information, and that's that the objective function has more than one variable in it. So that's, that's what the gradient of f is, negative gradient. It's pretty easy to write down. There it is. Okay, that is direction of steepest descent. Huh? Direction of steepest descent. If I go that way, I'm going downhill as fast as I can. So how far downhill do I go? I don't want this anymore. I'm going to erase this just so we don't get too busy here. Okay. There's my first search direction. And I'm just going to search in that direction. Well, how far do I go? Well, I go until I'm not going downhill anymore. What's that mean? Well, I go basically until, I'll add my uh, kind of sketch in and uh, missing contour line. I go until I'm parallel to a contour line. If I'm parallel, that means the slope is zero in that direction. If it's zero, that means I must either be at a maximum or a minimum. 
Well, since I started going downhill, I can assume that's a minimum. And then I'm going to stop right there. So that's your initial, oops, initial guess. Could be terrible. Right there, that one's going to be my first estimate of the minimum. Well, what do I do now? I'm going to go perpendicular to that and keep going downhill. So that arrow there is my next slope, and I'll just keep doing this. Now, every method has kind of a signature where you can kind of look at a path through space or something and kind of guess what the method is. This with uh, with the traveling salesman problem, we did nearest neighbor. If you haven't seen that yet, go back and check out the nearest neighbor, neighbor algorithm. Just keep messing that up. Um, and the very last step from your last city down back to your home office is often a very long one. That's kind of a characteristic signature of the nearest neighbor algorithm. This one, the characteristic signature, is that every search direction is perpendicular to the one before it and the one after it. Okay, that, when you start seeing that, that's a pretty strong hint. You might be looking at the result of a steepest descent method. So there's what it looks like. Now, once you pick a search direction, the only variable you have is how far do you go in that search direction. So once you've picked a search direction, it doesn't matter how many variables you design variables you have, whether you have two like we have here or a thousand. Once you pick a direction through design space, through three space or a thousand one space, the only thing you care about now is how far down you go. And I'm going to call let's see, let's do this in another oh, I got green here. How about that? Okay distance in that direction, we usually call D. D for distance. It's one of those few things that's actually uh, kind of uh, makes sense there. Um, and so what I can do now is I can, since I have a direction and I have only one variable, I can plot the objective function against D. So I'm going to make this a little short here, um, a little small, like that. And we would call that D star. Right? So here's the method in, in words. Step one, pick a search direction. Well, step one, pick a starting point. Step two, pick a search direction. Your search direction is the negative of the gradient at that point. S step three, search along that direction. And this is what we call a 1D search because now there's only one variable. And to, to search along that direction, you need a 1D search algorithm. Well, if you've gotten to this point in the, in the course or this point in the videos, you've probably seen a couple of 1D search methods by now. Pick one. Many of them will work in the right conditions if you, if you, uh, limit, you know, observe all the, the uh, assumptions. Don't violate those. They'll work. So you do a 1D search. You find the 1D search, uh, find the minimum, D star. You march down that far. That's your new estimate. Go back. Find a new search direction. With a new search direction, you do another 1D search. Once you've done another 1D search, you find that minimum. That's your new, uh, that's your new estimate, and you just keep going. And the way this one would, would converge, there's that step, and I can kind of hypothesize that the next, the next 90 degree turn will get me awfully close to that. All right. So I'm trying to freehand this. This isn't going too well. There we go. So there's pretty much what your convergence path would look like, or your path through design space would look like. This is in the book, of course, and it'll make a little more sense if we uh, do a numerical example. So let's again go to MathCAD rather than MATLAB, uh, because it's easier to see sort of in an interactive way what's going on. We'll go ahead and go through a, a couple of steps of steepest descent in MathCAD. Okay, here we are in MathCAD, and let's go ahead and do the uh, couple of steps of the steepest descent algorithm. I've started by typing in a very, very simple objective function. It uh, just makes an ellipse here, and it's pretty obvious that the minimum is at zero, zero. Now, this isn't really practical. There's no, no physical implication here, but it's a pretty good learning tool because it's easy. And we, we since we already know what the answer is, we'll be able to tell if our uh, algorithm is working like we want it to. So first thing I'm going to do, actually do a little bit of bookkeeping over here. Oops. Yeah. There's a, 
a system variable called origin. I'm going to do a global definition, say origin is 1. It isn't obvious at first what that means, but when uh, MathCAD uh, looks at uh, vector addresses, if you've got a list of numbers, it starts that address at 0. So the first element in a vector is the 0th element, unless you tell it otherwise. Well, I just told it otherwise. Um, you don't necessarily have to do this, but it makes it a little easier. Um, these methods, or implementing these methods, eventually becomes kind of a bookkeeping exercise at some level, and uh, starting all your counters at 1 is is it's a way to avoid some some problems later on. I've gotten in the habit of doing that. You can go and set it up here as one of your tools, I think, but then it's hidden to you. Here it's it's explicitly declared, so it's usually a better way to do this. Um, next step is to define the gradient of the objective function. And in general, you'll probably want to use the uh, symbolic tools in MathCAD. And uh, so it's going to go ahead and calculate that. I want to know what that function actually looks like symbolically. So I'm going to go right up there and click that arrow, evaluate symbolically. The other way to the, the uh, keystrokes that go with it are control uh, dot. If you want to use that, you can too. Now I learned how to use, let me do it, there it is. I just did a refresh the screen to show that that's 6x and not just 6. Um, I learned MathCAD about a thousand years ago before Windows, and so I memorized a lot of these keystrokes. If you ever see uh, stuff popping up on the screen where I didn't click anything, it's just because I'm using a, a shortcut key that uh, you, you don't necessarily need to, to know. So if you're not quite following that, don't worry about it. So that was the first element of the gradient. Here's the second. Do the exact same thing now, only now I'm going to do the derivative with respect to y. Oops, there we go. And then I just hit control dot there and separate those out a little bit and just hit control R. Okay, so those are obviously the two elements in our uh, gradient vector. It's pretty obvious that the derivative of that is 6x and the derivative of that is 2y. So, next thing we're going to do is let's, uh, we're going to need to define a starting point. Let's pick a bad one. I mean, we already know that the minimum is at 0, 0. So let's pick 4, 4. Okay, that's, that's a ways out. And the other nice part about it is that the gradient is going to point down this way. The gradient isn't going to point right at the center. If I picked that as my starting point, it would find the center in one iteration because that actually points towards 0, 0. So I'm purposely picking a bad solution so we can uh, see how uh, steepest descent will find it. So let's let's uh, define our starting point. And this is x. This this zero I'm putting in here. X dot zero. That dot is a text subscript. This is not a vector address. I can make this anything I want, as long as it's a valid uh, uh, variable name. I can put it in the subscript there. So I'm just saying x zero just because. That's uh, going to be our, our starting point here. So here's y0, and I'll make that 4 as well. And let's you know keep track of what we're doing here. I'll put first iteration. Now you see right there, this is, I don't know, Times Roman, whatever font that is. Right now, it looks like a variable name. I don't want this to be a variable. I want this to be just a text comment. So if I hit a space bar, see how it changes uh, font to, I think that's probably Arial there's no such thing as a variable name that has a space in it. So if I put a space, it has to be a comment. It has to be text. So there it is. And so I'll say first iteration here. And uh, it's nice to, to, to uh, put some headers, some comments in there so you can figure out what you're doing. So I need my, the, now the uh, two components of my search direction. And I'll just call the first component S1. And this is not a function. Now, this really is going to be a number. Let me... Okay, what I just did is I said I want the first component of the gradient, which is that right there. I've assigned it to df dx, that variable. So there it is. And I want to evaluate that at x0, y0, at those two points. So this is not a function. This really is going to be a number now. But there's one problem with it. I don't want to go in the positive gradient direction. I want to go in the negative gradient direction. So there it is, minus 24. 
and let's just say S2. Okay, so there it is. There's there's our first search direction. Our first ser search direction is going to be minus 24 minus 8. Well, if you were to go up here, start there and go about three times, well not about, exactly three times as far in the x direction as you do in the y direction. Got a slope of minus one, well, of a third going back that way. Yeah, it looks about right. That would take me to about there. So that, that passes the sniff test anyway. Now, now that I've got a search direction, I need to see how far in the in that direction I should go. And I'm going to use a variable called d to just define how far I go along the search direction. And I need to define my variables as a function of d, and I need to define the objective function as a function of d. So I'm going to make another variable called xd. Right? And that's just uh, x as a function of d, and I, and I have to call it something other than x or y because I'm going to reuse those for other things. And uh, so this is going to be my starting point plus d times s1. Right? So it's starting point plus the distance in the first component of the search direction. In fact, let's, let's do this. I can, this isn't going to hurt anything. I'm going to try to save some space here to keep things on the screen for you. So yd, oops, it's going to be y0 plus d times s2. Okay, that's the second element of the search direction. Now, if you want to get real tidy here, what I can do is I can do that and just click right there. It'll do a little bit of housekeeping for me if that's what we want to do. Hit Control R. So I've got that. Last thing I need is the gradient, or I'm sorry, the objective function. We'll call it FD. It's F X D sub D. And this is this is going to look a little clunky, but it works. So rather than having F as a function of X and Y, I want it to be a function of X D and Y D, which are in turn functions of D. So I've now got the objective function. Uh, as a function only of that dimension d. So this is a one, a single variable search. That's a single variable problem right now. Once we have a search direction based on the gradient, once you've defined that, it doesn't matter how many variables, how many dimensions you're searching through. Once you've found a search direction, that always comes out to be a function of a single variable. So let's do that. I'm going to go ahead and just blindly type this in. I'm not even going to think about it. Okay, well, what's that mean? Number one, the search direction D always has to be positive. If it turns out to be uh, the minimum is in a negative search direction, that means you weren't going downhill, you were going uphill. So I already know D has to start at zero. That's the lowest number we can reasonably have. There it is. See up there? That's, you know, 2 times 10 to the fifth, so what's that, 200,000? Well, my sense is this default range here it's picked is too big. And it is. Oh look, so you can actually see there is a minimum there. Well, let's zoom in a little further. Okay, there. Now I know that D star is going to be a little less than 0 0.2. Well, the way we're going to find exactly what that is is to do a one-dimensional search. Now, rather than make this too complicated, I'm going to go ahead and just use the the uh, MathCAD minimize command. In your homework or in your projects or things, you may want to use one of the single variable search methods we've learned in the class. Now, I need a dummy variable to search for, so I'm going to, to use this for the search. So I'm just going to call it dd. See what that comes out to be. 0 0.179. Well, that looks about right. Tell you what, let's zoom in just a little further and see if that's right. <coughs> yeah, that looks about right. That, that you know, certainly one, 0 0.175 would be right about there. So this, this looks right. One last thing I want to do here. Let's make that something called D star. Okay. And so what I want can do now is I can say x1, which is my, my next estimate of the minimum, is uh, 
x d d star and y1 is oops y d of d star okay so now that i know how far to go in the in the in the s direction i know what d star is i'll just use those to tell me what the corresponding x's and y's are so my next estimate is minus 0.286 and 2.571. Well, just for yucks, let's go back here. 2.571, that's about right there. Minus 0.286 would be right about there. Well, that is a lot closer to the minimum than I was. Let's go ahead and do a second iteration. Now, rather than type all this stuff out again, what I can do is just copy that and just paste it all back in here. And I'll just edit it. That's that's a so second iteration. Now instead of starting at zero zero, I want to start at one one. Now I'm still going to use S one and S two because I'm, those those subscripts are uh, refer to which element of the search direction vector I'm using. Down here, that's got to be a 1, and that's got to be a 1. Oops. Okay. Now, this doesn't look like it has a minimum now. What's going on? Well, just because I, I'm, I'm left, I have the, the plot range left over from the last iteration. Let's go ahead and just guess that. Well, there it is. So the right answer is about 0.4 something. And there it is, 0.417. Okay, so let's actually let's just do this. Let's there we go. Now this will be x2 and y2. See how this goes? We've just done two iterations. And doing the third iteration is just more of the same. So I happen to be now at 0.429 and 429. Where's that? On this plot. Well that's about right there. Well, that's awfully close. Should we go one more? I mean, we, we, we've got it going on here. Let's just go ahead and do one more iteration, see how close we get to zero, zero. In two iterations, we've gotten pretty close to the right answer. So let's go ahead and now we'll edit this. This is now going to be my third iteration. And it's pretty obvious you can do as many of these as you want. So now I know what that's going to be S2, or X2. That's uh, Y2. Put in a two there. Now, are there cleaner ways to do this? You bet. This is not an especially efficient or clean way to do this, but it's easy to look at, and that's the value of MathCAD. If I was going to do a lot of this, I certainly wouldn't do it this way. I would write a, a MATLAB routine. So let's see, x2, y2. Okay, that looks good. I'm going to move that over a little bit. Okay, so those those look like plausible search directions. Um, that looks right, that looks right, that looks right. Okay, this looks good. Let's change the range a little bit. Okay, so it looks like the right answer is about 0.18 or so, and there it is, 0.179 again. Actually see that number again. And there's now x3 and y3. Okay, and so y or at the x value really is close to the minimum. We're a little bit up from the minimum, so now we're right about there. So we're very close to the minimum. And you can see that as we go and uh, extend it out through more and more iterations, we'll get closer and closer. Eventually, we'll satisfy some exit criterion that says, OK, we're close enough. We're as close as we care about. Let's stop the, the iteration, because this can go, at least in theory, forever. Usually what we'll do is say, well, when the objective function changes by a small amount or the design variables change by a small amount or we've gone through a fixed number of iterations, we'll stop. We'll usually use those for our exit criteria. So there you have it. There's a simple example of steepest descent with all the intermediate calculations. Hope this helps. We'll talk to you next time.